don't think I've had this many lights since I was last in a prison cell, but <laughs> hey-ho. So, who is Natalie? And I don't know if the jury's still out on this one, but I'm going to take you on a journey. Natalie is very, very complex. Natalie is hypersensitive to everything that's happening in this room right now. The lights go out. I'm already thinking about the tech guy. I'm thinking about what you're thinking and what you're thinking. Are you judging Natalie? And let me tell you why. I grew up in a very disadvantaged area in Glasgow. And unfortunately, I was one of the children that's parents get caught up with the heroin epidemic that brushed through the streets of Scotland. And that's difficult to talk about. It's difficult to talk about how complex you are as an adult when you're still in a process of healing. My childhood, there was lots and lots of pain, lots of misery. And now as an adult, I score 10 on an ACES questionnaire. So every type of abuse that could happen in your life happened to me. My father died in 1986 while in prison in a suicide cell and he committed suicide. And for my whole childhood, I blamed myself. Did he kill himself because I wasn't good enough? And that created such a divide in my family. And it was a divide that was never to be repaired again because it created a broken in my mother. And it was a broken that she could never come back from. And my grandparents focused on that broken and they re then removed me from my mother's care. Which if you're already a complex kid from a disadvantaged background, scoring already 10 on an ACES questionnaire, then being removed from your mother, already thinking, did my father not love me enough to stay alive? Now thinking, does my mother not want me? Does she not love me enough to fight for me? because she kept my sister, and I couldn't understand. Me and my sister were incredibly close throughout all of our life. And my mother would always say, when I'm not here, you only have each other. And we always remembered that. So although my sister lives in California today, we speak five times every day on the phone. From the first minute she wakes up in the morning to the last thing before I go to bed at night because she's the only person in my life that didn't abandon me. She didn't reject me, and she accepted me for who I was, faults and flaws. My childhood was difficult, and as were my school years were incredibly difficult, because this word that we throw around, two words, normal and love, and I don't know what they mean, even today. What is normal, and who defines who is normal, and what is love? I know that I think we love, that I have this overwhelming feeling, but I don't know what love feels like. I don't remember being a child and being told every day that I was loved or needed, or that I had a purpose in this society, or I had a place or a voice, or that one day I would be in a room where people would be listening to what I had to say, because what I grew up hearing as a child was, nobody wants you, you're not loved. Why do you have to behave like that? Why can't you pull your socks up? Why do you always need to be the loud one? And now, knowing what we know, I was displaying all sorts of child adverse childhood experiences and so many layers of complex trauma because people projected things on to my life, to my childhood, I could never take back. Men took from me as a child what I could never be replaced. Because when you take that and it's gone, the void is there. It can never be filled. So growing up was incredibly difficult. Because although I had friends who loved me dearly, and they did, we were so close. I could be in the busiest room just like this and feel so alone. I could be in the greatest company. I could be sitting with Billy Conley. The conversations could flow and so could the laughter. But I would be inside my head thinking, am I good enough? Do they love me? Is what I'm wearing okay? Because I was so critical of self so disconnected from who I was ever supposed to be. Never nurtured, 
never feeling like I had a place in society. I didn't even know what career I wanted to have. I just knew that I cared for people. So my work experience would take me to some hospitals because I thought maybe I'm going to be a nurse. But my disadvantaged life had another journey for me. Drugs and alcohol became the only comfort blanket, the only thing that ever accepted me for who I was. Drugs and alcohol didn't discriminate. They just welcomed me in and they loved me. And I went to every corner of the globe to escape me and the drugs that I took. But I took the problems with me because I was the problem. The problem was in self. I went to Greece to work. I found copious amounts of MDMA. I went to Manchester to work. I found crack cocaine. Eventually, I went to California. In the first few years, I thought, you've done it, you've done it. But I was drinking alcoholically, and I hadn't done it. It was fake it till you make it, and I wasn't making it. And I met a man who I thought loved me unconditionally for who I was. I thought he accepted me, and he was a powerful man, very, very powerful man, very controlling, but I thought that he loved me. And he projected that power in unimaginable ways. The trauma that I had experienced as a child had nothing to what this man was going to put me through. And he was a big player in America, part of the Mexican Mafia, so I was controlled. I couldn't go out, I couldn't leave, I couldn't do what I wanted to do in my life and was introduced to a drug called crystal meth. And this was the warmest comfort blanket I could ever wear because this man was abusing me sexually, mentally, physically. I would come home and he would have another woman in the next room having sex and I had to live that life because I didn't know how to escape. I was too scared to leave. And then I became pregnant. And then it was no longer about me. It was about how do I keep something unborn inside me safe so this man can never harm this child. And I called my mum back in Scotland and asked her to get me a flight home. And I escaped California two days later. And I mean escaped because I did escape. I was in the back of a 4x4 four four van with a blanket over me driving to San Francisco airport quite traumatizing. I was 27 years old. I was lost. I had no money, I had no career, and I was five months pregnant. The whole flight home, I questioned, how can I be a mother? Do I put the baby up for adoption? Should I give the baby to my mum? If I can't look after myself, how am I supposed to look after a child? But I put all that aside. And I thought, no, nope, we're going to do it. And I gave birth to my son. And this word love, I don't know if I loved him. What I do know is the most overwhelming feeling came over me. And I presume that's love. But if you don't come from a childhood having experienced that, how do you know? And thinking, now that he's born, and knowing everything that happened in my childhood, I wanted to make it different for him so that he didn't experience disadvantage or pain or abuse or neglect. But that's not the way it was to be. Because I was still broken. Everything in me was still broken. I had massive, massive abandonment issues. Every relationship I picked was with a toxic man that would just treat me like dirt because that's what I was mirroring. I was mirroring a complete disconnect from self and not believing in me because no one believed in me for me. No one told me I was good enough. I didn't have the ability to love myself. And I met another man, got into another toxic relationship and out that came another beautiful kid. But I was the same broken. And one day I couldn't take it anymore. I was using six and seven grams of cocaine every day and drinking three bottles of wine with two children, working a full-time job and getting them to nursery. And one day I couldn't do it anymore. And I went to the nursery and I told the staff, 
I think I'm having a nervous breakdown. I can't do this any anymore. I'm a drug addict, I'm an alcoholic, and I need you to help me. And that's what they done. They helped me. They took me to the GP, who then put me in contact with a service. Some of my workers were really rubbish to begin with, and they were judgmental and discriminative. And I felt like the environment I was put in created a lot of stigma, but I continued to go because I believed it would help me change. And a worker came and she was my God. She explained to me post-traumatic stress disorder. She explained to me everything that had happened in my childhood was actually not my fault. And she placed me in an environment for six months, removed me from society to place me in a safe place for six months where doctors could diagnose me with PTSD and I could actually learn that the trauma I experienced as a child was not my fault. I didn't ask for that to happen. I didn't ask for all those men to take from me what didn't belong to them. I didn't ask for my father to die a suicide. I didn't ask for my mother to become broken. I didn't ask to be separated from my sister. That's what happened. I had to accept that's what happened. How do you move on from that? So what I done was I learned to believe in a power greater than me. And I started to connect with that power that's so much greater than me. You can call it what you want. People call it God, Allah, nature, whatever you want. It's my power and I have to connect in it. And my life's not wonderful today. I don't drive a Range Rover and stay in a big fancy Cala home. That's not realistic. But what my life is today is helping others every day. I started to create recovery environments where I lived and the Scottish Prison Service had recognised one of these environments and they came to me and says, can you create the same thing within the Scottish Prison Service? Absolutely. Is this my purpose now? That's my head was trying to figure out. Is this my purpose in life now? And isn't it ironic that my, it took for my father to take his life me to become a drug addict and alcoholic, lose myself, have two children, have them removed from my care, so everything that my parents done to me, I done to my children, but I stopped it while they were young. I recognised it while they were young. I fixed myself while they were still young, and I'm now still in this process of healing. So my job today is to create models of recovery and bring them into the Scottish Prison Service. My job is to ensure that these men and women are returned to their children at the end of their sentence. Not only returned to their children, but returned whole to their children. Creating ideal versions of themselves before they're released from prison. Looking at their drug choices, understanding that everyone in society will be impacted at some point with trauma. Who teaches us how to deal with it? Teachers didn't teach me, my parents didn't teach me, but now that I have this profound understanding of trauma, is it maybe my job, is that my purpose, to teach others about a process of healing? My family's complex, and they're difficult, and they're dysfunctional, and they're crazy, but they're mine, they're my family. And my mum might not have had the tools to love me unconditionally as a child and to nurture my needs, but it didn't mean that she didn't love me. It just meant that she gave me the same set of tools that was given to her when she was a child, and they weren't great. So I have a profound understanding of self, connection, and the mistakes that I made in my life don't define who I am today, and they never will. Today, I support the men and women leaving the Scottish Prison Service. I support them to leave their home. The defragmented families that they're leaving to become whole. Not only do I support them inside the prison, I support them out in the community. I created a charity and I have a voice today. You won't silence me or mute me or you won't disregard me anymore. Because it wasn't that I didn't fit in with society. It was that society didn't fit in with me. Society didn't want to listen. They didn't want to hear. So today, I'll be the voice for everyone that's silent until you find your own voice. Because being broken is not the end. 
And when people say you were a little bit of broken, I say, no, I was a little bit of wounded. Because all wounds heal, but they might leave a scar. And love is a huge word. And I want to end on this, because it's a word when people say, oh, I love you. And I'm like, don't throw that about so freely, because it's a huge word. But just on love, and I would like to end on this, I would like everyone to take your mobile phone out your pocket or your bag and message someone that you love, that you've not told, that means something to you, whether it's your partner, your mother, your father, your son, your daughter. Take your phone out and message them and tell them two words. Love you. That's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>